Thank you very much for a very kind in introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you, Reverend, for, for having me. Thank you, everyone, for, for inviting me and for coming, for coming today to talk about such an important and serious topic. I myself have been seriously, professionally working on and in the Middle East and studying Iran and the Middle East for over 25 years, including in the United States government, at the White House, in the Bush National Security Council, as well as the Clinton National Security Council, at the State Department, the U.S. Mission to the U.N., and at U.S. embassies across the Middle East. But it wasn't until early 2001 that I actually met spoke to and listened to an Iranian or an Iranian official who supported the Islamic Republic of Iran. For the 15 years before that, I had only met and read the supposedly authoritative accounts of Iran's domestic politics and its foreign policies from Iranian expatriates and from others here who had their own agendas basically to reverse the 1979 revolution that had established the Islamic Republic. But from 2001 to 2003, I was one of a very small number of US officials authorized to talk, think about that, authorized to talk to Iranian officials. You had to be authorized in the US government to talk to an Iranian official, to hear their perspectives, to talk to them about Afghanistan and Iraq. Fortunately for me, one of those I was authorized to talk to was then a much, I wouldn't say lower level official, but today he's Iran's foreign minister. But I had the opportunity over 10 years ago to talk to him, hear what he had to say about Afghanistan and Al Qaeda. And in that context, especially right after the 9-11 attacks, I can tell you firsthand, my colleague has re recently written about it in the New York Times as well, Iran worked with us, the Islamic Republic of Iran worked with us, worked with the United States, supported us to overthrow the Taliban and expel Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan and establish what had the potential to be a much more representative and enduring political order in Afghanistan. Although I worked hard with some of my American colleagues to continue that cooperation with Iran over Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda, and to expand it to make a broader US-Iranian peace, my boss at the time, my big boss at the time, decided instead, without telling the US diplomats, my colleague Ryan Crocker and myself, that instead of continuing to work with Iran, the United States would condemn very publicly, in a very high profile way, condemn the Islamic Republic of Iran as the core of an axis of evil that the United States would focus its efforts to go to war against. That was the 2002 speech by George W. Bush to Congress. Iran's nuclear program at that point became the justification, or perhaps more accurately, the pretext to lay the ground through rhetorical disdain for the Islamic Republic, through crippling sanctions, and through hundreds of millions of dollars in covert operations for eventual war with Iran, the heart of this designated axis of evil. Now American officials and pundits tell us that their coercive strategy worked. It worked to force the supposedly dictatorial supreme leader in Iran to accept the overwhelming popular will of the Iranian people, to elect a new president that would finally come to the table to make the required concessions demanded by Washington. This is a dangerous and ultimately self-defeating falsehood. Sanctions have never worked to drive a population to rise up, to force their government to accept the demands of a hostile foreign power. There is not a precedent in history. And in fact, we tried that in recent history. We tried that with Iraq. Before the invasion of Iraq, killing over a million Iraqis, half of them children, and again, before the 2003 invasion, and even then, in that 10-year period where we were imposing sanctions, killing a million Iraqis, it did not work to change Saddam Hussein's calculation or to collapse his government. 
That, in fact, took the all-out invasion by the United States in 2003 that, of course, killed even more civilians. And even after that, the U.S. hardly got out of it a strategically subordinated Iraq. Refusing to recognize the profoundly negative human and strategic consequences of sanctions, then in Iraq and now with Iran, that they only lead to war and not conflict resolution is very dangerous. This conventional narrative that sanctions forced Iran's supreme leader to allow the supposedly accommodationist new president, Hassan Rouhani, to come into office, also badly misreads Iran's recent election and who the newly elected president is. And in this regard, I'm largely going to defer to, our, um, to my colleague, my dear colleague and friend, Ambassador um, Mosavian, who knows President Rouhani, of course, much better than I do. But I want to point out, because it's important in terms of understanding just the basic data, that the new president in Iran was elected earlier this year. He wasn't forced there with overwhelming popular sentiment to force an accommodationist person into office. He was elected, elected in a tough campaign where he got just over 50% of the vote. It was hard-earned and decisive, but it wasn't an overwhelming landslide. And beyond that, President Rouhani, the only cleric on this year's ballot, presidential ballot in Iran, is not what you would call your stereotypical reformist or liberal in our political context. He belongs to the main conservative clerical society in Iran, not its reformist antipode. He's more accurately described, I think, as a moderate or pragmatic conservative. Certainly someone, not someone, who is inclined to surrender Iran's nuclear rights. He is dedicated to the Islamic Republic, having spent literally most of his adult life and his career defending the security of the Islamic Republic and its international position. Besides misreading this new president in Iran, President Rouhani, Falsehoods about what his election signifies are self-defeating because there's nothing new in Iran's willingness, the Islamic Republic's willingness, to actually work constructively with the United States in a way that could improve relations. In fact, the core elements of what Iran has now put forward the now foreign minister, then deputy foreign minister, ambassador to the UN, Javad Mohammad Javad Zarif, and President Rouhani, when he was previously a negotiator for the Iranian government and part of their Supreme National Security Council, they put forward some of these same proposals years ago, formally to European counterparts, but the United States reject them out of hand. The now foreign minister even put many of these ideas in an op-ed in the New York Times, again dismissed out of hand. In fact, since the early years of the Islamic Republic, its leaders at the highest levels have said that they are open to improved relations with the United States. Consider in this regard the caricature that we have of the supposedly dictatorial supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Said Ali Khamenei. From his early days in the 1980s, as then Iran's elected president, he has been on the record open to better relations with the United States. In 1984, for example, following what he said was, quote, the expressed wish of Imam Khomeini, the Islamic Republic's first supreme leader and founding father, Ayatollah Khamenei defined the Islamic Republic's foreign policy as, quote, an open door the Islamic Republic, he said, would seek, quote, rational, sound, and healthy relations with all countries, including the United States. When then-President Khamenei came to New York in 1987 to address the UN General Assembly, he told an Iranian newspaper on the record, publicly at the time, quote, certainly there are conditions where, nor where ties to the United States could be normalized. So why don't we ask what are those conditions and why don't we take them seriously? 
During his presidency, and since he succeeded Khomeini as, as the Islamic Republic's supreme leader, Khamenei, Ayatollah Khamenei, and the four Iranian presidents elected over the course of his now 24-year tenure as supreme leader have all said repeatedly, repeatedly and publicly, that Iran is open to better relations with the United States, but also that this is only possible, only possible on the basis of mutual respect, equality, and American acceptance of the Islamic Republic as an enduring legitimate political entity representing legitimate national interests. Those are the conditions, mutual respect, equality, and U.S. acceptance. To be sure, Supreme Leader Khamenei has grown increasingly skeptical over the years that the United States will ever be willing to accept the Islamic Republic on that basis. There is a substantial history feeding this skepticism, a history during Khamenei's tenure as su Supreme Leader of actually quite substantial Iranian cooperation with the United States, from Lebanon to Bosnia to Afghanistan to Iraq, on issues where the United States asked for and in fact received Iranian assistance. But in all of these instances of cooperation, Lebanon, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Iraq, the United States either pocketed Iran's cooperation and then intensified hostility toward the Islamic Republic or just intensified hostility. And as I said, I experienced this directly when I worked with, the, with diplomats from the Islamic Republic of Iran and some American counterparts on Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda in the immediate wake of the 9-11 attacks. After we had worked with our Iranian counterparts to overthrow the Taliban, to expel al-Qaeda from Afghanistan, and to establish this new government in Afghanistan, pocketing that cooperation. It was within weeks that we stood together in Bonn, Germany, to establish this new government, within weeks. President Bush designated the Islamic Republic as the core of an axis of evil, and steadily sought to justify a prospective attack against it. Notwithstanding this history and the deep skepticism it does in fact generate in the Islamic Republic today, skepticism about American intentions toward the Islamic Republic, Khamenei has, more than anyone else in Iran's political life, defined the fundamental Iranian position toward the United States. It's one of openness to improved relations with the United States, but again, this is critically important on the basis of mutual respect, equality, and American acceptance. In our book, Going to Tehran, my husband and co-author and I document that this is one of the strongest consensus positions in all of the Islamic Republic's foreign policy. And it very much shapes Iranian priorities today in the current diplomatic environment. So again, why has it been so hard for the United States to deal with the Islamic Republic on this basis, to accept it as an enduring political entity representing legitimate national interests? In the book, Going to Tehran, we argue that the fundamental problem is America's determination, especially since the end of the Cold War, to dominate the Middle East, to achieve a kind of hegemonic status over this strategically vital part of the world. And as part of this quest to dominate the Middle East, which went into overdrive after the 9-11 attacks, with invasions and prolonged occupations in Afghanistan and Iraq, that in fact became strategic failures for the United States, America has been unwilling to countenance the emergence of independent power centers in the Middle East which is exactly what the Islamic Republic of Iran is trying to do. The revolution that produced the Islamic Republic of Iran was at its core about two things. One, forging a political order that would seek to combine participatory politics and elections with, very much with, principles and institutions of Islamic governance. And the second core thing that the revolution was about was restoring Iran's effective sovereignty and independence 
After over 150 years of rule by puppet regimes beholden to outside powers like Britain and Russia, and since 1953 with the coup there, the United States. So the most immediate and consequential implication of a real, improved US opening to the Islamic Republic of Iran would in fact be ending America's post-Cold War quest for hegemony in the Middle East, a quest that has done such profound damage to Americans standing in the Middle East and globally and to hundreds of millions of Arabs and Muslims. Just as the American opening to China 40 years ago was predicated on an American abandoning of its failed and counterproductive drive to dominate strategically vital Asia, and accepting that the United States would operate in Asia, in that environment, shaped by multilateral balancing among the United States and key regional countries there, instead of by American hegemony, just like that, a real opening to the Islamic Republic of Iran will need to be predicated on the United States abandoning its hegemonic ambitions in the Middle East. On this issue of hegemony versus balance, I want to quote very briefly the single most critical sentence from the Shanghai communique from 1972 that set the frame for Chinese-American rapprochement. It said, quote, Neither side should seek hegemony in the Asia-Pacific region, and each is opposed to efforts by any other country or group of countries to establish such hegemony. For 20 years after the founding of the People's Republic of China, the United States could not accept the reality of a Chinese political order that refused to subordinate its foreign policies to American preferences. So for 20 years, the United States tried to isolate the People's Republic of China diplomatically, not even permitting them to go to the Olympics, and to strangle them economically. And we didn't just support regime change for the People's Republic of China. We supported a whole alternative political structure on Taiwan as the real government of China. And the results were, in fact, disastrous. Disastrous for the United States. Because trying to undermine the People's Republic of China actually undermined the U.S. position in Asia and got us into the tragic quagmire of Vietnam. Then President Nixon finally had the strategic insight and the political acumen to recast America's Asia policy so that it would actually serve American interests First and foremost, by coming to terms with the fiercely independent political order established by the Chinese Revolution in 1949. By doing so, Nixon saved America's position in Asia and restored the United States as a great power capable of proactively shaping critical strategic outcomes through smart diplomacy. Today, this kind of smart diplomacy toward the Islamic Republic of Iran is absolutely essential to arresting America's strategic deterioration in the Middle East and to restoring our global position. But it will require the United States to abandon our failed and counter counterproductive drive for hegemony in the Middle East and to instead accept the Islamic Republic of Iran as this enduring political entity representing legitimate national interests as an, and as an independent regional power unwilling to subordinate its foreign policies to American preferences. The prospect of that happening has made two of America's long-standing Middle Eastern allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, very, very anxious. Their anxiety is often expressed as concern over the Islamic Republic's emergence as a regional hegemon. But that is fundamentally misleading. Collaborating with Washington to be the regional hegemon was the Shah's foreign policy. It is not the Islamic Republic's foreign policy. I argue that the Islamic Republic is what I would call a paradigm of counter-hegemonic foreign policy. And by that I mean, as a matter of policy, the Islamic Republic aspires to be the Middle East's leading nation, 
economically, scientifically, and technologically. But the Islamic Republic's foreign policy and national security strategies are fundamentally defensive with an overarching goal to ensure the Islamic Republic's safety and security defined in terms of national independence and territorial and political integrity. The Islamic Republic's strategic objective is not hegemony, but in fact a regional order in which hegemony is not achievable, not by any other country there. To the extent that the Islamic Republic has been able to expand its regional influence, it has done so by supporting indigenous resistance to the hegemonic initiatives of others and by supporting political forces capable of winning popular legitimacy through elections. They're not invading anybody. They're supporting indigenous forces in these countries. Look at Iraq. The Shia Islamist and Kurdish parties that have been the heart of every elected Iraqi government since the overthrow of Saddam Hussein were supported for decades by the Islamic Republic of Iran. The secularists that Washington sought to impose on post Saddam Hussein's Iraq and, the, and having another minoritarian Sunni dictatorship, which Saudi Arabia favored, on Iraq, both of those models failed. The secularists and the minoritarian Sunni dictatorship both failed, not because of the Islamic Republic's assertion of hegemony over Iraq, but because the Islamic Republic worked very, very hard for a constitution and elections. Israeli and Saudi claims that the Islamic Republic of Iran will use rapprochement with the United States to consolidate its own regional hegemony are not just inaccurate, they are self-servingly disingenuous. For these, cl these claims mask what really concerns Israeli and Saudi elites, that their own regional strategies require a hegemonic US in the Middle East. Seeking regional dominance in accommodation with Washington has, was not just the Shah's foreign policy. It's been Israel's strategy for decades. Israel's national security strategy, including open-ended occupation of Arab populations and the consolidation of a near absolute freedom of unilateral military initiative in its own neighborhood, those two things require a hegemonic US in the Middle East that effectively immunizes Israel from the potentially negative consequences regionally and globally of that strategy. It also requires a hegemonic America capable of suppressing the emergence of independent power centers that could challenge that like the Islamic Republic of Iran. For if independent power centers emerge that could strain what Israeli generals call their quote-unquote freedom of military action, in other words, that the Israelis might in some circumstances think twice about initiating conflict, that's a problem. The former Israeli defense minister Ehud Barak said this on the record to the New York Times, that Israel's key concern about Iran, even with a nuclear capability, is that Iran could constrain Israeli decision makers the next time they needed to think about going into Lebanon. Similarly, Saudi strategy requires a hegemonic America. For the United States is not able or willing to invest blood and treasure to micromanage political outcomes in key regional arenas like in Egypt or Iraq or Syria then Saudi Arabia might have to deal with popularly determined outcomes in these, these arenas that it doesn't like. And such outcomes might ultimately mean that the Saudi royal family has to come to terms with their own public in ways that they've managed to avoid so far because of their alliance with the United States. But U.S.-Iranian rapprochement would be hugely beneficial for the Middle East, including for Israel and Saudi Arabia. Because in part, it would mean that like the United States, 
Israel and Saudi Arabia too would have to forsake aspects of their foreign policies that are dangerously out of line with regional reality. Here too, Chinese American rapprochement in the early 1970s often offers a couple of critical lessons. When President Nixon opened to the People's Republic of China, Taiwan and Japan, both long-standing American allies, were completely against this Chinese-American realignment because in their view it would upend, the it would have upended the fundamental premises of both Taiwanese and Japanese foreign policy and national security strategy. Yet in relatively short order, both Taiwan and Japan adjusted to the new, rea new reality of Chinese-American normalization. And they didn't just adjust, but with the specter of constant war sharply decreased, both Taiwan and Japan experienced the greatest surge of economic growth and domestic prosperity in their histories precisely because Chinese-American rapprochement grounded much greater regional stability and created the conditions possible to enable the integration of the People's Republic, economic integration of the People's Republic of China with the rest of Asia. If the United States opened to the Islamic Republic of Iran, Israel and Saudi Arabia would also adjust to the new reality, and they would both benefit, benefit enormously from it. Finally, a failure by the United States to achieve this kind of opening, this kind of strategic realignment with the Islamic Republic of Iran will have hugely negative consequences for US standing, not just in the Middle East, but globally. At this point in the Middle East's evolution of the Middle East balance of power, the United States cannot achieve any of its critical regional objectives, political, post-conflict uh, regional stabilization in Afghanistan, resolving the bloody conflict in Syria, fighting jihadi extremist violence, assuring the adequacy and safety of oil flows from the Persian Gulf. It can't do any of these critical things without a better relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran. And in this context, for President Obama to reiterate that the military option is still on the table for him to, in a sense, even threaten the Islamic Republic of Iran as yet another mu Muslim country to disarm it of weapons of mass destruction it does not have would elevate the already high level of anti-American sentiment that we see all over the Middle East, threaten our remaining allies in the Middle East, and render their co continued cooperation with us virtually impossible. The Obama administration's, what I would describe as self-inflicted debacle over threatening Syria is important in this regard. Because after President Obama declared his intent for the United States to attack Syria after chemical weapons were used there in August, underscores for the world, especially for Middle Eastern public opinion, but for the world, that after our strategically failed military interventions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, we can no longer credibly threaten the effective use of force in the Middle East, especially for hegemonic purposes. Now, while this is roundly derided in Washington from both Democrats and Republicans, especially in Congress, while it's roundly derided as a weakness, it, in fact, actually gives us the best opportunity in a generation to pull back from what has been a profoundly damaging pursuit of hegemony in the Middle East and to do it with the opening that President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif have given us with the Islamic Republic of Iran. The, of course, it's uncomfortable for Americans. We don't like to hear um, chance death to America or anything that could, could do any of us any violence. But the really interesting thing in terms of looking at ourselves is whether or not that is determinative. And for me, I had to really think about it in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. My sister worked at World Trade Center 7, Building 7. 
she, she's okay. But it was an extremely difficult time for me. I was working at the U.S. Mission to the U.N. in New York. We were being evacuated, and my, I couldn't reach my sister. But we had had a dialogue just starting with our Iranian counterparts over Afghanistan before 9-11, because we had a mutual concern about the Taliban in Afghanistan before 9-11. And I was able to talk to, for just a few minutes, my Iranian counterpart, who was eager to, to find out about my sister. And it was a really important kind of personal moment for me that I think would do a lot to address U.S.-Iranian tension. But even more so, he said that he really believed that his president and maybe even the Supreme Leader would come out and condemn this horrific act of terrorism. And in fact, that Friday at the Friday prayers in Tehran, the Supreme Leader came out and condemned terrorism wherever it is, including in New York or Washington, which was unprecedented. And it made me really have to think and ask myself, as someone who went to Brandeis University, someone I'm from a family that is strongly supportive of Israel from the heart of New York, I had to really ask, what is terrorism? And what is Iran doing that is so different? Why are they coming out immediately to condemn this act of terrorism? Why are Iranians spilling into the streets, having a candlelight vigil to mourn the victims in New York? When people in Saudi Arabia and in some other places were celebrating, what's the difference? What's going on? And I had to really ask myself, and I remember years ago when I reflexively would think about Hezbollah, for example, as a terrorist organization. Professor Shibli Talhami once asked me, this is maybe 20 years ago, why, why do you characterize them as a terrorist organization? That's all I'd ever been told. I never thought that Hezbollah was really focusing their attacks on people in uniform. And of course, I'm against anybody being killed, including soldiers. There is a difference between groups trying to fight for their territorial integrity, for the liberation of their country, fighting soldiers, as opposed to those who are randomly killing civilians. There is a difference. And for Iran, whether we like it or not, because we're often at the bad end of it, the Iranians often focus on that difference. And they focus on supporting groups, whether it's Hezbollah or Shia militias in Iraq, not to kill civilians, but to fight armed, uniformed soldiers that have come into those countries, Lebanon or Iraq. And I had to really think about that. Is it just because I'm sympathetic with the Israeli that has gone into Lebanon, the American that has gone into Iraq? And I had to come to the conclusion, yes, it was that bias that I had been raised with, that I had, through academia, through the US government, had come to hold. So I don't support violence anywhere, including, again, against soldiers. But that was a really important moment when Ayatollah Khamenei came out and used that Friday prayer sermon to condemn terrorism, to condemn what had happened here in the United States. And there was essentially, I don't want to call it a moratorium, but people stopped chanting death to America in, this, in, in Iran for a little while. And we worked constructively with the Iranians. And this is where when you don't focus on and stay on the diplomatic track, you do yourself such damage. When we went off that, with the axis of evil, of course that comes back in Iran. Now, we still don't like the language, but what would we expect? And again, if we lose the opportunity today, we shouldn't expect that Iran is going to be saying things that are very nice about us. They're fighting for their survival, not just for the state, but for a system that, while we may think of it as, I don't know, maybe a little bit odd, Many in Iran think of it as just as valuable, just as important as what we're trying to do. Not that the Islamic Republic is perfect by any stretch, that most Iranians could list for you the thousands of things wrong with the Islamic Republic, but it is their system that they're trying to evolve, that they are trying to make authentically serve their interests to combine these critically important aspects of participatory politics and election, elections with Islamic governance. It is for them, for so many of them, the project of generations. They're not going to get it right today or tomorrow, but it's theirs to evolve. And we can continue to kind of label everything as terrorism and to oppose it and to sanction it. And as I tried to trigger kind of um, 
your reaction in my, in my presentation, that really does us more damage. And as Ambassador Mosavian said, Iran continues to, under really crippling conditions, evolve its economy, its science, its technological fields. When I go to the University of Tehran, the majority of the students are, are female. The majority of the students in the, the, med the faculty of medicine are female. I see female cab drivers professionals across the board. That country is modernizing, is not just surviving, but in so many ways, scientifically, educationally. They're gonna approach, the World Bank says they're gonna approach um, non-discrimination in gender access to education, probably about by, by next year. They've gone from low double digits of female literacy under the Shah to 97% of those who have been educated by the Islamic Republic, those between the ages of 15 and 24, 97% of women today, which is the same for men. And we dismiss it as all these crazy mullahs. We're the ones who really have to come to terms with the fact that this, this entity is gonna survive. 